We have been preaching our way through the Gospel of Luke, and we have found many, many challenging words by Jesus, particularly in these past few weeks. Chapters 18, looking backwards, chapter 18, the first half of which we looked at last Sunday, and then 17 before it and 16 before it, were filled with particularly challenging sayings by Jesus. But we found that after we studied them, that we came to understand them. And we realized that, in fact, these difficult passages of Jesus at a casual glance, they seem difficult, too difficult to understand. They're actually wonderful words of blessing for those who choose to really study them and to look into what Jesus was saying in the historical context of them. Going back further, chapter 15, with its three parables of the lost being found, a sheep, a valuable coin, a much-loved son. That's a much-loved chapter. But our challenging chapters actually began in chapter 14, where Jesus said that anyone who wants to follow him must consider what it will cost because following Jesus is not always easy. It is always a blessing, though, but sometimes... The challenging of following Jesus is that it means everything. Family, reputation, money must be put in a secondary place of importance to following Jesus. And I mentioned before, we all know of people for whom it is too much to ask of them. And I told you of a person here who, when I preached on this, said to me, I can't do that. They've never come back. It's really not that hard. But for some people, it's overwhelming, and so they refuse to become a father. In the early 16th century, two men, two priests in the Roman Catholic Church, came to see the errors of their church. The first man, a man named Thomas Bilney, came to know Jesus as he read through the Bible. And the excitement of his newfound faith caused him to begin openly professing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he spoke against the errors of his Roman Catholic Church and its teaching that one could be saved by doing good works. He said, no, one is saved by faith, through grace alone. Now, on November 29, 1527, Thomas Bilney was arrested and had to face several Catholic bishops and priests day after day who pillaged him psychologically. And on the threat of death, Bilney was told to recant the gospel that he had spread. That was November 29th through to December 7th. And on that day, Bilney was given one last chance to forsake his message, the truth, and adhere to the Roman Catholicism of his day, or else he would be killed on that day. Thomas Bilney's courage failed him, and he gave in and he spent many months paying penance to the Roman Catholic Church of his day. Meanwhile, in 1517, a man by the name of Martin Luther was brought before a Roman Catholic Council, much the same situation. And he knew that his opposition to the Roman Catholic teaching regarding doing good works such as paying indulgences as the only means of getting into heaven could cost him his life. And when asked to recant by the council, it was demanded of him, Martin Luther responded, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. And God did indeed help him. And Luther stood. And the Protestant Reformation took hold and spread. Meanwhile, returning home in 1528, Thomas Bilney fell into a deep depression. Nothing could lift his spirits, his friends and his family, even fearing he might take his own life. However, in 1531, three years after 
his denial of Christ, Vilni decided he could take it no further. He could no longer deny the truth that God's word had shown to him. And he decided he would take a stand, just as Martin, as Martin Luther had. And so Billney said goodbye to his family and friends and left to openly preach God's truth again. And so he was arrested once again. And upon his arrest, Billney was immediately sentenced to death by being burned at the stake. As the officers placed the firewood around him, Billney remained firm. And as the fire was lit, he would not deny Jesus Christ. Instead, with his final words as the, games, as the flames engulfed him, Thomas Bilney cried out, Jesus, I believe. You see, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It's not a social club. It's none of those things. In prison, Jerry found out what it was to be a Christian in a sea of non-Christians. Followers of Jesus here in Canada might not face arrest and being burned at the stake, but there's a price to pay for sure. We need to prepare to take a stand for Jesus. Well, in the second half of chapter 18, which we will preach through today, we find again Jesus uttering some difficult sayings, tough sayings about, it, about what it will take to follow him. There are three tough sayings, in fact, about taking a stand for him. We will read them, plus we will also read of one incredible blessing at the end of, a cha of the chapter for a man who did, in fact, follow Jesus. Before we get to that chapter, though, I want to read to you an inspired piece of writing by an anonymous young pastor serving somewhere in Africa. I'm not sure where it is. But this piece of writing was given to all ordinands at the time of our ordination. And I have kept this piece of paper on my desk at my home, right beside my computer, beside my Bible, and I read it continually. Particularly when I need to be reminded of why I follow and serve Jesus. That young pastor from that unnamed African country who wrote out this piece, tacked it on a wall in his house, entitled his work, My Commitment as a Christian. He writes, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, my future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, 
until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problems recognizing me. My banner will be clear. To that I say amen and amen. Diana Kirchig is going to read for us, and so now let's turn to verse 18 of Luke chapter 18 and start our reading with an amazing conversation between Jesus and a rich young man. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. We find this story in three places, in Matthew 19, in Mark 10, and in Luke 18 here. The man is popularly known as the rich young ruler. The rich part we will read about shortly. The young part coming from Matthew 19, in which he expressly described as this young man being young. And the ruler part from the Greek word archon used here a word which can refer to a man who generally had administrative authority. In other words, a leader, official, or ruler. The word was used of various Jewish leaders, including those in charge of a synagogue and members of the Sanhedrin. In any case, this man's life was to be commended. Rich, young ruler. He seemed to do everything according to God's law. Jesus just quoted five of the Ten Commandments to him, and the man said, All these I have kept since I was a boy. We have no reason to not believe the man or to doubt his, his sincerity. Doing the right thing we know is always commendable, but Jesus knew that there was more to the story than what this rich young ruler was lighting on. Jesus was concerned for this man because he was wealthy and powerful. And Jesus wanted him to count the cost before saying that he would come and follow him. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This is the first difficult saying by Jesus in today's passage. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. This rich young ruler reminds me of the story Rav, Ravi Zacharias tells about a boy who loved collecting marbles. This young boy lived next door to a little girl who had a lot of candy. And one day the young girl said to the little boy, if you'll give me all of your marbles, I'll give you all of my candy. He said he'd think about it. The next day he decided to do the deal. All of her candy for all of his marbles. But he hid a few of the marbles in his room before giving the rest to the little girl for her candy. She gave him all of her candy. That night, though, the boy couldn't get to sleep. He tossed and he turned and he turned and he tossed all night because he was so troubled. And what do you think troubled him so much he couldn't sleep? What troubled him was the thought, did she really give me all of her candy? <laughs> Jesus knew that the rich young ruler was like that young boy. He wanted everything Jesus could give him, but he wasn't prepared to give all he had to the Lord. He wanted everything God to give. And in response, Jesus asked him for everything he could give. You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You may remember that back in Luke 9, Luke chapter 9, we read that one time another man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, if that man had followed Jesus, he might not have a place to live or sleep. 
It is implied that he did not follow Jesus after all. Then, Jesus said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another person said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Over and over again, Jesus told these folks to pick up their crosses and follow him. He repeatedly called them to be sold out for him. Essentially, Jesus was saying, if you're not going to give me everything, don't bother me. Jesus isn't interested in just some of our marbles. He wants them all. For Jesus, it is all or nothing. Returning now to the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This is the second difficult saying by Jesus in today's passage. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Anything is possible with God. But Jesus tells, how, tells us how hard it can be for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, the Christian walk is not easy for anyone, but it is particularly hard for the wealthy. In fact, Jesus goes on to say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. This was not meant to be taken literally. Again, as we have seen with many others of Jesus' difficult sayings in recent weeks, this one was hyperbole, a deliberate exaggeration designed to make a point. The point being that difficult choices have to be made in order to truly follow Jesus. With this rich young man, the issue was money. It's not true with everyone. And it wasn't just money, it was his love of money. It's not true for everyone that Jesus calls everyone to give up their money and to follow him. But we do all have to make choices. I know a man who wouldn't follow Jesus because of lust. I would talk to him and he just loved this woman who was not his wife too much. That was his issue. What will you give up to follow Jesus? This young man came not to trip up Jesus, but to learn from him. It was a sincere inter interaction. He was sincere in what he said, but he had a superficial understanding of what it would mean to follow Jesus and how to inherit eternal life. He didn't understand that following Jesus would mean more than simply keeping the Ten Commandments, five of which Jesus named, it had to do with relations with other people. But the commandments that weren't named had to do with the relationship with God. And that's where the man had problems. Following Jesus would mean giving up everything for the sake of Jesus and the kingdom of God. But Jesus knew that. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife, or brothers, or sisters, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Too many are like the rich young ruler. We long for the privilege of everlasting life, but are unwilling to put Jesus first in this life. What was holding that particular person back? What did he really trust in? Now there's Nothing spiritually wrong with wealth itself. The Bible is full of examples of godly men who were commended by God who were very wealthy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, David. The problem with this rich young ruler was in his love of money. The man had made provision for his future and he had placed his security in temporal things. It is not wrong to provide for the future in fact, we should prepare for it. But this man had placed his trust in riches and excluded God from his future reckoning. But Jesus knew that his wealth could not save him from death. 
to never save anybody from death. But Jesus could have given him eternal life if only he had put God first. Is there anything, any hindrance that you are unwilling to give up to follow Jesus? You may not be wealthy, but if there is something that you possess or that possesses you, giving it up is a vital part of following the master. You must have your all. And he calls gently all the time, come follow me. It might not be money, but it could be a stumbling block in your life. But whatever it may be, that you need to give up in order to follow Jesus, fully be like Peter and the other disciples who gave up everything to follow Jesus, as Peter said. As a result of what they did, they did not fail to receive many times as much in this age and in, in the age to come eternal life. Those are the words of Jesus. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. This is the third difficult saying by Jesus in today's passage. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. In many ways, one has to feel sorry for the disciples. Jesus said many difficult to understand things them. Jesus thought so far out of the box of what was normal that he must have blown the minds, as our modern vernacular says, of the disciples. The most difficult teaching, though, for the disciples was this one, and Jesus said it repeatedly, that he would arrive in Jerusalem and be delivered over to the Gentiles, and they would mock him and insult him and spit on him. They would flog him and kill him. Jesus said that repeatedly. But he told them it would be in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the most amazing of which was the one that on the third day he will rise again. That death could not hold Jesus down, that Satan could not defeat him, that evil people could not silence him. All of these things, they, they just blew the disciples' minds. And they understood them only after Jesus came back from the dead on Resurrection Sunday what we in the Western Church call Easter. That was amazing news. But Jesus did enough marvelous things in the midst of all the difficult sayings that he told the disciples that he was giving them just a, a taste, a foretaste, a glimpse into how there's such joy when people give up everything to follow him. So in closing today, then, we come to an event at the end of chapter 18, an incredible blessing for a man who had decided to take a chance on Jesus, to call out to him in perseverance with a prayer request, and who ended up following him and praising God. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When, they heard, when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Do the events of this story seem familiar? Twig your memory? <coughs> Remember last week we read about how the disciples had tried to stop parents from bringing their babies to Jesus for him to touch and bless. It was the custom of parents with rabbis at that time, but the disciples, no, 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 no. You can't trouble the master. They didn't want him troubled. And here the disciples tried to stop a blind man from troubling Jesus. No, no, no. In the Gospel of, Luke, of Mark, we are told that this man's name was Bartimaeus, a name that means son, Bar, of Timaeus. And Timaeus is a word that means unclean or defiled. What a terrible name. So here was a blind beggar with a terrible, unfortunate name. Up until this moment, everything had been against him. He was probably a dreadful sight in old clothes, unshaven, unclean. A man who had been told that healing of his blindness was medically impossible. 
But he heard that Jesus was passing by. And he changed all of that. If Jesus was on the scene, any miracle was possible. And Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus. He was famous throughout the land, and so he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Think of that phrase. Have mercy upon me. He knew that he needed mercy. And his only chance was Jesus. Odds were that Jesus would never pass by that way again. Never pass by that man so closely ever again. That man knew it. The point of fact is Jesus never went past that man again. That was, this was that man's one chance. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Again, does this story seem familiar to you? Last week, we read about how Jesus told a parable, a parable about a persistent widow who called out again and again to an unjust judge to grant her justice. And eventually, she got what she asked for. And the unjust, just, unjust judge gave her justice. And Jesus said that we need to be likewise persistent in our praying to our just God if we want situations changed in our life or in our loved one's life. And so this man, he just kept on calling out to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked Bartimaeus. Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Immediately, Bartimaeus followed Jesus. He did not go his own way, but went with Jesus, probably all the way up to Jerusalem. What a marvelous story of incredible blessing. But if Bartimaeus hadn't cried out, he would have been blind the rest of his life. Think about that. And so is this the day of a miracle for you? Do you have that kind of faith to call out? It could be. Everything is possible with God, Jesus earlier said to Peter and the other disciples. And here Jesus certainly showed mercy to Bartimaeus when he asked for it. Imagine Jesus walking by right now. This is a special divine moment when we think about it. And so will you seize the moment? Will you do today what you need to do to seize that moment? Follow Jesus. You will be blessed when you do so. Amen.